Good morning, Christ Presbyterian Church. Hi, my name is Megan Arnold, and I'm the Director of Ministries here. We're so glad you're here this morning. We welcome any of our visitors, and if you are a first-time visitor or a recent visitor and you haven't filled out one of our newcomers' card, there's some cards on the front welcome table that have a QR code, and if you will just open your um, camera on your phone and scan that, you can put your information into our system and then you'll get all kinds of neat information from us. So we welcome you to do that, and we're so glad you're here today. On that note, if you're a regular attender, and if you've come more than two times that now, you're a regular attender, next Sunday, just start moving forward. This is a season of visiting, and we want to make room for those who are visiting and maybe those who come in late. So I just encourage you to keep scrunching forward. Richard will not spit on you while he preaches, I promise. We have several announcements. Today, Sunday school got back into session. So if you missed it, don't miss it next week. All children's classes are are going, the adult class is going, and we would love to see as many families come as possible. Next week, we're back to fellowship lunch. Who loves fellowship lunch? Okay, good. Who likes to eat a lot of food at fellowship lunch? Okay, so if you want a lot of food at fellowship lunch, then you have to bring a lot of food. So if every family would just bring a dish that serves at least 12 people, we will have plenty of food and we'll have a little extra for those who forget to bring their dish. And it's okay if you do, we'll still bring you into the fold. So next week after church, we will have our annual, or we have it monthly, fellowship lunch that takes a break in the summer. Um, What else is happening? September, a couple things. They're in your bulletin, on the website, on the slides. I'm just going to rattle them off. Men's Night Out on the 5th, Women's Bible Study starts, Women's Bible Study starts on the 6th, and there's a sign up in the hallway. If you're interested, please let us know. Um, And then we're going to have a youth event on the 17th uh, for high schoolers up here at the church. We've got some some fun young adults who are going to lead them in a bonfire and some yard games. So go ahead and mark your calendars, youth, for that. And the last announcement um, Richard will do for Inklings Beyond. Oh, wait, don't come yet. I forgot to tell you one more thing. Sorry, you're going to work on those squats. Um, If you have a child in children's church, we are trying to um, kind of enforce our child security policies. And one of those is when we bring our children to Sunday school, if your child is under 12 years of age, they have to be signed in at the registration desk. Well, if your child is going to go to Sunday school and then going to go to children's church, you need to register them separately. So you can get a sticker for Sunday school and a sticker for Children's Church when you sign in for Sunday School. Or, if you don't come to Sunday School, you can just get a Children's Church sticker right before service starts. I just was trying to save you time when that announcement for children to be dismissed is. Just make sure they're registered. And if you didn't do it already, you can do it when you take them this morning. Okay? That's it. Now, Richard. So, yes. uh, This week, we are going to do another one of our installments in the group Inklings Beyond. Uh, Those of you who aren't familiar with what that is, this is a group of folks that are meeting in our home one Thursday night a month, uh, going through, well, we're starting, we're going to be going through a variety of different uh, fiction works over the course of, well, the horizon. We don't know how long this is going to go. Right now, we have begun with the Narnia Chronicles, and this upcoming Thursday night, we're going to be discussing the Silver Chair, and the only requirement that we have for this for you to come is that you've read the book. That's it. Just that you've read the book and that you let us know that you're planning on coming. Uh, It's an open discussion. It's guided. It's all ages are invited wherever you are on the spectrum, however many times you've read it, uh, whether in fact, even if you've only listened to the audio version, that's fine, too. We just want you to be very well what engaged, connected uh, with the storyline and what C.S. Lewis was trying to do there. One last thing I should say, and, and maybe just kind of explaining, why are we doing this? You may be wondering. It's, it's just like stories. Like, who cares about stories? And I would say the Lord cares about stories because he gave us imagination. Uh, he gave us, as par- part of what it means to be made in his image, according to his likeness, he, he gave us uh, imagination. And oftentimes, you think in terms of how Jesus we see in the Gospels, engages with people and teaches us to help us understand deep, deep truth. What did he do? He didn't, it wasn't just the Sermon on the Mount, right? Didactic teaching. It's also parables that we might know, that we might understand, and we might really grapple with the truth. You could even say it's learning styles as being 
you know, uh, the diversity there is being manifested in how Jesus engages uh, us. So that uh, has a lot to do with why we're doing this crazy thing called Inklings Beyond. So I invite you to come Thursday night uh, at 7 o'clock at our house. If you need to know how to come, how to get there, just let me know. Grab me or Sarah. We can let you know how to get there. Oh, there was one other requirement. That is, um, now I guess I said this already, but I'll just say it again. So first, read the book. Second, let us know you're coming because if we have enough people coming, I want to let my neighbors know and make sure it's cool that there would be cars parked in front of their house. Okay. So now we're going to shift the gears here, shift the gears from Inklings Beyond uh, as we're about to have the prelude played. Uh, I just want to be able to encourage us at, to be a, move into a space of, of meditation and uh, prayerful preparedness uh, as that prelude is being played as the, the, we're moving into the time of the service beginning. Um, we like clarity, right? A lot of us don't do very well with living, at least for extended periods, in, a, in ambiguity and fuzziness and having just constantly not knowing what's going on. Um, I guess we could, any of us could live for a short period of time without knowing that, but we, we like clarity. We like to understand, to know what's going on, and that's good. It's okay. That's, that's a good desire. Problem comes when we insist on it, on understanding and comprehending everything. Uh, it's part, again, a part of how we've been made according to God's image and his likeness to want to know, to understand, to grasp things. But we will never grasp him. We can understand much that is true of him, but given that he is infinite and given that his ways can be mysterious, we are never going to comprehend him fully. Truly, never fully. So let me read you these words. It's in your bulletin. If you got it, it's the last in the quotes in the notes. This is a little, little snippet, a stanza from a beautiful old song by William Cooper, um, contemporary and friend of the great John Newton. Uh, this is the beginning line of Cooper's song, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. I just want to invite you in the next few minutes as the prelude is being played to think back in what ways is, might he be moving in some mysterious ways in your life? You're troubled by the questions and the uncertainty. But maybe it's not that he's not doing anything or worse that he's doing bad things. But maybe it's just, you just don't know. And maybe we can lean into who we know him to be and trust him. Because his ways are mysterious and still good. Let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Let's stand as you are able. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive call taken from Psalm 67. I'll take the part of the leader if you will take the part of the people and say that aloud together. Uh, scholars believe this is a, um, a Thanksgiving psalm, a Thanksgiving psalm in the context of a fruitful harvest. Not surprising, the people then responded not just with thanks, but also um, the asking for more. The asking for more, more of yet what you have given, Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Here's the question. Why? Why would we ask for the Lord's blessing on our lives? Why would we ask for his provision in our lives? Uh, the psalm is quite instructive here. It's the refrain, verse 3 and verse 5. Fundamentally, it must not be just for ourselves. It must be for the sake of others and even more the Lord's glory that we would ask for his blessing on us. Nothing wrong with asking. Why? May God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine upon us that your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, would you make this our great desire that all the peoples would praise you, that all the peoples would praise you. Oh, this has to be the burden of the psalm. It has to be the burden of your heart. Would you make it the burden of our hearts too? Lord, for you can be known. You have made yourself known. We don't have to guess and wonder as to who you are. You are the judge, the ruler. You will do right, freeing us from having to take justice into our own hands. You supply for our every need. We can lean on you, depend on you. Daily so for all that we are, Lord, Lord, let the peoples praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. We pray in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Remain standing as we continue to worship.
Ebenfoster. I could ask Evan Foster to join me up here. Where are you, handsome? Come on up here. Stephen Lee, would you join me as well? Evan is about to take his vows of membership and to be baptized. So let me explain how we got here. You're going to have to do this for just a few minutes. Now. I warned you. Um, so how does a young man find himself on a Sunday morning standing up in front of the congregation about to take his vows of membership? Let me explain this at two levels, one procedurally and then one at a more depth level. Okay, Just from a procedural standpoint, here's what happens. So he has expressed his desire to join this church as a member and to begin to be able to take communion those first Sundays of the month. Okay, So then what that triggers in, in our context here in this church is then I have conversations with his parents, we have conversations together, long conversations together, uh, enjoyable conversations together, just learning more, me getting to know him better, um, getting an opportunity to, to, to discuss some pretty significant things. These vows that he's about to take here in just a minute and his understanding of those and just the encouragement one to another in, oh my goodness, this is the Holy Spirit at work, in, Aslan on the move, if you will, uh, in this young man's life in the context of this church and in his family, which then takes me to the second thing. And that is not just, so how does he end up in front of us procedurally, but here's how I wanna, where I want to talk to you. How did you end up here? I'm not, that's not a question that I want you to answer. I want you to think about it, okay? I was thinking about this even this morning. How did you end up here? Here's what I want to encourage you, Evan, to, to, to consider and be thankful for and not let go of, okay? In, the, in a long, over a long period of time, growing up in the foster household with two siblings and their parents and all those dogs that are growth into the image of the Lord Jesus. You have been discipled. They have loved you. They have taught you. They have modeled for you the gospel. All those things that we've spent those many, many minutes in my study talking about, right? Those five, these five vows that you're about to take. Your parents have been a, a, a living models and speaking teachers of all those things. And then, of course, I know there's been no two individuals in your life outside your home teaching you and modeling those things as well. Okay, That has a lot to do with how you got here in terms of an unfolding story. Okay, But even more than that, I mentioned the, the work of the Holy Spirit. He has been at work in your life through all those things and a whole bunch of different things that you and I don't even know about, bringing you to this point, okay? And here's what I want to encourage you with. Stay engaged with the Holy Spirit, okay? John 15, one verse I want to read to you, okay? John 15, verse 5, Jesus says of himself, and the Holy Spirit implicitly. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So my encouragement to you is abide, abide, abide. That's how you got here, okay? And that's how you will grow. That's how you will grow. Okay? All right, here are the vows. Five. <laughs> so just respond after me and to answer up front the, the question. You acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy. Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Christ? Do you? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you? 
and do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study security and peace? Do you? Okay. Well, now comes the sacrament of baptism. James Christian Foster is baptized you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this younger brother. I thank you for claiming him, O oh Father, as one of your children. that as surely as this water has been applied to him, you have said as surely as that water has touched him and cleansed him in this sacramental way, as surely as that, you will cleanse us from our sin. It's not anything we have to do, it's not anything that he has to do, it's what you have done. He is free. In Christ, we are free. It is finished. There is nothing we have to prove. Yes, we need to be coming back to you again and again and again, asking for forgiveness daily and through the day for all the ways we have fallen. represent you in so many ways in this world, in our families, in our workplaces, in our classrooms, to one another, even in this place. Jesus, you are certain. We know that. Cleanse me for sinners such as I. Pray for Evan. Thank you for allowing him to take these vows. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for the, the degree to which he already understands these things. But we know those of us who are a little bit further ahead he's going to grow in these things. But as much as he understands it now, at this stage, he's going to grow in it. We pray that he would help you to do that, that he would be living in these things with you, as John was doing, in this abiding, that he would know him himself as his branch, that he would be found. We pray it in your name. Amen. Hey, let's welcome this man. our time of confession and intercession, our reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 4. This is God's word. Therefore we must pay attention, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We're about to hear preached uh, here in a few minutes, and your wisdom, this passage that we just read. We come to you acknowledging our need for your mercy and grace. And in this passage in Hebrews, your word warns us not to drift away from the message of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And yet we confess that we've allowed a great many distractions to divert our attention away from this truth every day. Lord, forgive us for not heeding the message of redemption, 
that was confirmed by signs, wonders, and miracles. We were condemned and judged to pay the penalty for outward rebellion against you. You, our creator. And then by your grace, Christ paid for and ransomed us at the price of his own life. He secured our deliverance. He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. We've taken lightly the great salvation secured in Christ. Lord, forgive us. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, who is crowned with glory and honor. Lord, we praise you. This morning we pray for encouragement, refreshment, and strength for those who herald the gospel, specifically for Pete and Ruth Mitchell, who were here a few weeks ago, for grace and favor when challenges or obstacles face them as they live and minister in Toulouse, France, and as they are currently traveling here in the States, that you would provide times of peace and relaxation to refresh them, restore their energy, restore their strength, restore them emotionally and spiritually. Fill them with your Holy Spirit so that by faith they serve and do not grow weary. And then in obedience to your word, we make intercession on behalf of the civil leaders, those who are in positions of authority in our city, in our state, our nation, so that we can live peacefully, quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. We pray for the president, all states and nation leaders. We pray for our mayors, our city council members and other local leaders for President Biden, for Vice President Harris, for Governor Bill Lee, Mayors Joe Pitt, and Wes Goldman. By faith, we call our leaders to turn to their creator, to you. That they would seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and receive from you everything they need in order to lead well that decisions made by them will be inspired and directed by your Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You alone are God. You are subject to none, yet all, all are subject to you. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We pray these things in Christ's name. And now, as you're standing again, um, this is time for children ages four through six, and they can slip out for children's church.
morning, CBC. My name is Will Cody, and I am the campus minister at Austin P for our denomination. And I am excited to be the once a month special guest preacher here this morning. Our text today is Judges chapters 14 and 15. I think they're on page 214 of the Pew Bible, if you have that. Last week, we heard the introduction of our last judge in this book of Judges. The last judge here mentioned in this book is Samson. And as we've been reading through the book of Judges the past few months, we've seen God's people. We've seen them repeatedly, over and over again, rejecting the Lord, not trusting in him. But when they get into trouble and they cry out to God, he sends them a warrior judge to save them from their enemies. We've seen this cycle over and over and over again. Last week, we heard the, from the angel of the Lord who came to this childless couple, and he told them about this miraculous baby that they would bear. And this baby was going to grow up and begin to save Israel from their latest and greatest enemies, the Philistines. So the writer has set us up in this chapter to have some really high hopes for this last judge and this miracle baby, Samson, who's all grown up now in our text. So let's turn to Judges chapter 14. And we'll read chapter 14, we'll stop for a little while, and then we'll talk about some stuff, and then we'll read most of 15 after that, in a few minutes. Hear God's word to you, his people. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relative or among all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistine? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking, the Lord was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. After some days, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave them some of the honey, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped it from the carcass of the lion. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. And as soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, Let me now put a riddle to you, if you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast, and find out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen, 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, Put your riddle, that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You've put a riddle to my people, and you've not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father or my mother. Shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her, because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, Samson, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, 
And he went down to Ashkelon, that's a Philistine city, and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those he had told the riddle to. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let's ask God to help us. Father, every week we come to you, we read your word, we hear it, and we need you to bring it down into our hearts. Help us to understand it in our minds. Most of all, help us through that to understand you and to trust you with our hearts. And we pray you use this weird, crazy story of Samson to do just that. Send us out trusting you this Lord's Day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you may not be aware, but this is the 40th anniversary of something that's pretty interesting. 40 years ago, on, April, on August 23rd, um, 1973, a man named John Eric Olson, he put on a mask, he walked into a bank, and he fired the gun into the ceiling, shouting to everybody, let's get this party started. <laughs> Olson apparently was as bad at getting parties started as he was at bank robberies because only a few minutes later, way earlier than he had anticipated or planned, the cops show up, foiling his robbery, foiling his getaway, and after the initial chaos and confusion subsides, he ends up, at the end of, at the end of this, holed up with four hostages inside the bank. And the standoff between Olson and his four hostages and the police lasted six whole days they were in the bank. And during this time, he demanded his best friend be broken out of jail and brought to, this really bad, bad dude, uh, be broken out of jail, brought to the bank to be with him and help him uh, in this bank hostage situation, which the police obliged. They, he also demanded $700,000 uh, guns, bulletproof vests, and a Ford Mustang. And if he didn't get any of this stuff, he said he was gonna kill the hostages. But a strange thing started to happen inside of the bank. Olson told the prisoners that he was going to shoot them. <laughs> he threatened them a lot. He pointed his gun toward them, fired his gun toward them. He threatened to blow them up with dynamite. And th that's not the weird part, because that's what you would do if you were um, holding hostage. You've got to show them who's boss, right? The weird part, though, was their response. Because rather than being angry at this Olson guy, I would be at least a little resentful. This guy's ruining my whole week by this hostage-taking thing. Um, instead, they started taking his side, and they started turning in, they started like being against the police and for Olson. For example, at one point, Olson threatened one of the hostages that he was going to shoot the, <laughs> the hostage in the leg because he wanted to show the police that he meant business. He was threatening to shoot this guy in the leg, and here's what the guy said later. He said that this is how he felt at the time. He said, how kind I thought he was for saying it was just my leg he would shoot. <laughs> well, the four hostages were finally rescued. The police like, uh, pumped tear gas into the, into the bank, and they were, they were able to arrest Olson, and the people were unenthusiastically rescued, <laughs> the hostages. But get this, so afterwards, the hostages refused to testify against Olson in court. And they, they actually ended up testifying in his defense, and some of them even helped pay for his legal defenses. They, um, and then after he went to jail, they went to visit him in jail to keep up the relationship that they started that one day in <laughs> August. It's a crazy story. Can, I'm, I wonder, can anybody guess what famous city this happened in? Stockholm. Stockholm. Yes, that's right. This happened in Stockholm, Sweden. This is where we get the term Stockholm Syndrome from, is from this event. Stockholm Syndrome, if you've never heard of it, is this phenomenon where captives or hostages turn against those are, that are trying to rescue them and actually turn and even join up with those who are holding them hostage. They're kidnappers. Um, there's a lot of controversy about whether this is a real phenomenon or not. But what is real is that this is absolutely what's happening in our text today, in Judges 14 and 15. This is what happens to the people of Israel. By the end of this text today, they, they turn against God, who has come to rescue them, and they're joining up with the Philistines, with their enemies, who are subjugating them. And this is a new low for the nation of Israel. What is God going to do? How is he going to respond to a people like this? I usually have, like, a big idea that kind of forms what we're going to talk, what the text is about. But today I have a big question 
instead. And the big question is, how does God respond when his people turn away from him? How does God respond when his people turn away from him? We have a great example of this in our text today. How do we see him respond to Israel, and how does he respond to us today when we, his people, turn away from him? And usually this is where I have a verse or two that we get into the text and start to figure out what's going on. But let's start this <laughs> sermon. Let's look at a verse that's not there. Let's do that instead. Uh, there's a verse that's not here that we re need to really pay attention to. I mentioned in the intro that it's like this domino effect in the book of Judges. Um, first, what happens is the people turn away from God. Sometimes over and over again. People turn away from God. Then they get taken over by their enemies. And then the next thing that happens is they cry out to God. And then finally, the Lord is over, overwhelmed with compassion for this people. And he can't help himself. He sends a savior. He sends a judge to save them. This is the cycle, repeated cycle in Judges. But in this latest cycle with these Philistines, one crucial domino is missing. And as you know, if you've ever done dominoes before, if you miss one domino, the rest of the thing doesn't happen. It's conspicuously missing from this story. And here's what it is. They've stopped asking for help. They've stopped crying for help against their enemies. Every time they've cried out in the past, God has responded. Even when God's like, I know you're all going to turn from me again. I'm not sending a Savior this time. Even then, he still sends a Savior. <laughs> he can't help it. But it's gotten to the point that they don't even ask for help anymore. So what's going to happen next? And not only are they not asking for help, but their judge, their savior that's supposed to come and save them, he doesn't seem to care either. The story of Samson here <laughs> opens up with him not only just being friendly with the Philistines, their enemies, he actually wants to marry one of them. He wants to weld himself into the Philistine, uh, the Philistine family, the Philistine nation. So for a moment, I just want, like, why is this so bad what's happening? Why is it so bad what the people of Israel do, are doing? And what Samson is doing. The obvious answer is that they're going to be they're going to be stuck in their slavery and their bondage. But there's a bigger picture of why this is so bad. Throughout the history of Israel, in the Old Testament, there is this thread that weaves the whole Bible together. Read the, especially the Old, Te Old Testament, the New Testament too. And the thread is that God has chosen a people for Himself. And through this people, through Israel, God is going to bless this cursed world. He's going to redeem this rebellious, guilty place. And he's going to save it through this people, somehow. They are, the, they are the conduit of blessing to this world, is the people of Israel. And we see this thread um, threatened to be cut several times. One of the dramatic things as you read through the Old Testament. For example, when Abraham seeks to have a child with Sarah, without his wife, Sarah, if, if he were to, if he were to um, get his way, Isaac would have never been born. And there would have been no Israel. When the people are in Egypt, they're threatened to be snuffed out by, the, by Pharaoh in Egypt when they're in bondage. When Babylon exiles the nation of Judah, and it almost seems like the, the, the monarchy is destroyed and the people are mixed in the nations, and it seems like this, this is the end of Israel. This is it, it, for, it feels like for a moment. Israel has these dramatic moments where they're almost wiped out as a nation in all these various ways. But here, Israel is being threatened with extinction as well. But it's not this big dramatic event. It's more like, it's more like radon gas. You know radon gas? It's the threat. It's a silent but deadly gas, right? The threat. It's more like radon gas. It's silent. It's odorless. It slowly leaks into your home, and it kills you. Because if they continue to be unfaithful to the Lord, to never even cry for him to help, their fate is to be mixed up and assimilated into the Philistines, and there's no more blessing for the world. God's promises are, are null and void. And in only a couple of generations, and the fastest way to do this is probably through marriage <laughs> and having children with the Philistines. It's probably the fastest way to make this happen. In a few generations, there will be no people, there will be no entity, there will be no ch chosen people left with which God can bless the world. And they aren't, they don't care. They aren't going to fight for themselves. They're not even going to ask for help. And they need somebody to come and fight for them. My wife and I read this book this summer together. It's an interesting book to read together. It's called How to Stay Married. Uh, Weston Duke mentioned this book a few weeks ago. This is a, 
It's a like humorous autobiographical memoir kind of book. And so the book opens with uh, the author. His, name's, his name is Harrison Scott Key. So the, author, the book opens with the author Key telling the story at the very beginning of the book of how his wife of three children came to him one day and told him that she was having an affair with the neighbor and she wants a divorce so she can live with this neighbor. So over the next few days, they're living in this, him and his wife, they're living in this kind of in-between marriage and divorce purgatory kind of state. And he's trying to figure out, what am I going to do? So he goes to the pastor of the church that he's at at the time, and he tells him the whole story. And the pastor prays for him, and then he says that he asks the pastor for advice. And the, the pastor says, well, we could discipline her. And Key's like, I don't think that's going to help my marriage. <laughs> what if she doesn't stop the affair? And the pastor answers, well, excommunication. So Key leaves the guy's office. He's sitting with this information. And he's wondering, what should I do? Should I give up on her? Should I give up on our marriage? And he has another conversation with a family friend named Angie. And he's talking about everything that's happening. And she says something shocking. For some reason, it was shocking to me, even as I was reading the book. But this is, I'm going to semi-quote what she says in this book. Angie says, to, um, Angie says to him, you're going to fight for her, aren't you? And he says, I love her, but I also hate her. And Angie responds, fight for her. Key's wife was unfaithful and turning away from him, turning away from their marriage, turning away from their family, toward this miserable, destructive, stupid life that she was choosing. And she had no one in her corner, not even herself. She needed someone to fight for her. And her husband responds by picking up that fight. He chose to fight for his wife. Israel's God, who so often calls Israel his wife and that he is her husband, responds to their turning away this way as well. He chooses to fight for his bride, to fight for his people. Enter Samson, the big fighter. We read in verse 4 that while Samson is seeking this wife, this whole ordeal with his wife is just the lighting of a fuse to a huge powder keg we'll get to in, verse, in chapter 15, where God is going to save them from themselves. We read in verse 4 that this whole ordeal was from the Lord, for the Lord was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. God is going to use this all to save them, to fight for them. Our big question, what happens when God's people turn away from him? Answer, he never gives up on them. He fights for them. We will see, as we go through this, we are going to see God fighting for his people through this guy, Samson, who doesn't, doesn't seem like he even knows what he's doing, but God is fighting for him. Do you have a God who fights for you? Do you have a God who, when you turn away, when you disobey, when you fail, that this God fights for you? When you fail the God of success, or you fail the God of grades, or maybe you failed the, t the test, you failed the, the God of um, having the perfect family. Maybe you've, uh, what about the God of romantic relationships, or the God of wealth, or the God of having a good image online or in person? Do those gods fight for you? What happens when you fail those gods? They grind you and spit you out. They condemn you. They kill you. That's what happens when you fail all those gods. What happens when you fail the God of judges? He fights for you. He fights for his adulterous people. And the rest of this text is going to be raising another question as God fights for his people. The, the next question as we start to get to the end of this next section is, how does the Lord respond? Yeah, he fights for you, but what if his people don't want to be saved? What if his people don't want to be saved? Let's see what the text says to this question. Let's get into this story that I've read. Let's walk through this story, and let's see God fight to save them and how they respond. So here's the story. Samson wants to marry this Philistine woman. But when he's on his way to go visit her, suddenly a lion attacks him. Out of, comes, out of this crazy, comes out of nowhere in the story. This lion comes out and attacks him. But the Spirit of God, and we get the first hints of Samson's crazy strength here, the Spirit of God 
um, helps Samson, and he rips the lion in half like you would rip a Sam's rotisserie chicken in half. Just, just rips it in half. So when, the, when, the, when he comes back that way later toward his wedding feast, he goes to check out, I wonder what happened to that lion I ripped in half. <laughs> he goes and checks it out, and in the, this desert environment, the, the carcass is dr- completely dried out, and a nest of bees has um, formed inside, and there's honey, and he scrapes it out with his hand, and he's walking. I don't know how this works, I, honestly. I, I don't know how he was walking with his hands, but maybe he's just licking his hands, <laughs> I guess. Uh, somehow he takes some honey, he's walking, he gives it to his parents somehow. I don't know how this works. Uh, but when he gets to the wedding feast, finally, it's, he's got this seven-day wedding feast. And they notice that the people at the wedding feast, all the Philistines, they notice that Samson didn't bring any friends. Apparently Samson has no friends. So they kind of coax 30 guys into coming and being his friend. They're not quite friends. That's why it's, it's called companions here over and over again in this text. Because this is supposed to be a party. And we need lots of people. And Samson's got no people. And during this week, Samson's working the grill for this feast. He says that he's preparing the feast. He's making some goat burgers maybe. And maybe there was a lull in the conversation, but Samson wants to make things a little fun. And he also m- wants to make it interesting. So he asked the 30 companions, would y'all like to hear a riddle? And let's make it interesting. Let's say, if y'all get the riddle, then I'll give you 30 pairs of clothes. And if, I, if you don't get the riddle, you got to give me 30 pairs of clothes. And apparently these are pretty fancy clothes. They talk about being impoverished here. So these are probably a, a big source of their wealth was in these clothes. So he tells them this weird riddle. <laughs> he says, in verse 16, it says, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And I love that this happens to rhyme in English. They made it rhyme in English. Now, this riddle is hilarious because it's both impossible and it's also kind of an easy riddle, okay? It's impossible <laughs> because it's about this thing that happened to Samson that nobody knows about. It's a secret, you know, experience that he had uh, when he found the honey in the lion. It's a ridiculous riddle. It's like asking, uh, it's like, if my, hey, let me tell you a riddle. What's in my pocket? That's a terrible riddle, right? That's not how riddles work. <laughs> but it's also like, they could have figured this out. Like, given enough days, they, these guys could have figured this out. <clears throat> What's the strongest thing in that area at the time? I mean, lion's probably somewhere at the top of that list. What's the sweetest thing in the, in the land? Honey's probably the first, if not second or third. They could have figured this out. So it's impossible, but also really easy at the same time, this riddle. Nevertheless, they can't figure out this riddle, and they threaten his wife to get the answer. They're going to burn her and her dad and their house all together. So the wife, understandably, I mean, she turns to Samson, and she turns on the waterwork. She tortures him with her tears, and finally, he can't take it anymore. On the last day, he tells her the answer to the riddle, tells her about the lion, tells her about the honey. And then, of course, they come to him, and they're, they what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Ha, ha, ha. He gets really, and now Samson gets really angry because he gets betrayed by his wife. He loses this, this, uh, this bet that he had. And he replies, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. So he knows how she got the answer. His heifer, his cow, he calls her here, which probably hurt his wife's feelings, calling her a cow. So then he runs off to this other Philistine town, Ashkelon. He finds 30 random dudes that I guess are about the same size as his other 30 companions. He finds 30 guys, kills them, takes their clothes, and brings it back and gives it, probably throws it in their faces, these 30 changes of clothes. Then it all lands with Samson running home to his mom and dad's house in hot anger while his wife is married off to another guy. Best wedding ever. (laughs) Then it gets worse, all right? It only gets worse as we get into chapter 15. Or maybe it gets better, depending on your point of view. Our story escalates in chapter 15, and it's only going to escalate from here. It's like, you bring a knife to the fight, he's going to bring a bazooka. Sam's going to bring a bazooka. It just gets crazier and crazier. So verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, if you have it, we'll have it on the screen, you have it in your your Bibles. See if you don't start to feel a little bit of sympathy for the (laughs) Philistines here as well, a little Stockholm Syndrome for the Philistines. (laughs) So chapter 15, verse 1. After some days, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go in to my wife in the chamber. But her father would not let him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not 
her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, this time I shall be innocent in regards to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson comes back to his wife, and who knows how many months later this is. It's a long time, it sounds like. And it seems like he knows that he went a little overboard. So he's brought an apology goat. This is the equivalent of roses um, or chocolate. I don't know what you do for y'all spouses. Um, but this is a makeup present, this goat that he brings. And now put yourself in the dad's shoes for a second. At the end of your daughter's week-long wedding feast, this is what happened. The groom got really ticked off, really mad. He yelled, he called your daughter a cow in front of everyone, and then he runs home in hot anger. And you haven't heard him from him in months. What would you think was going on? I would have probably thought, well, he's probably not coming back. Let's get this daughter married. Um, I, yeah, if I, was, if I was the father, I think maybe possibly this is time to move on from Samson. So he says, I thought you utterly hated her, so I gave you to her companion. Now, this is meant to be funny. It's also kind of tense, though, because the father, you know, imagine you're the father again, and you've got Samson who showed up. Last time you saw him, he was hot-tempered, mad as heck. And they'd surely probably heard of these 30 naked guys found in Ashkelon and put two and two together that there were 30 companions and 30 murders in this place. So he comes up with this idea that, Samson, why don't you marry my other daughter? He's just, I think he's just trying to keep himself from getting hurt. But Samson doesn't want that. He doesn't want that at all. And the only logical thing any man would do in this situation, I'm sure we've all been tempted to do this at some point, he wipes out the food supply of an entire nation. <laughs> you can imagine yourself doing this. You go out, you catch 300 jackals, 300 foxes. He ties them together. You know, he's got to crate them. He's got to feed them. This is a meticulous, long thing that he did. He's really angry. <laughs> Remember, it's the harvest time, so he takes these jackals. He ties their tails together. Somehow puts a torch. I don't know how it works, but he puts a torch there, sends them out through the field. And he's got probably on a cart, sends one out every few hundred yards or every kilometer, and then he just destroys everything. This is the harvest time. This is when it's about to, it's time to get the food because all your food from last year is running out. And then Samson goes, and he, he himself goes and destroys all the standing grain, everything that's left. He goes, and he destroys it. And then, just to make it even worse, he destroys all the olive trees and the, all the olive orchards that the Philistines have. And now the Philistines are in big, big trouble. This is their food supply destroyed for the coming year. So instead of going after them themselves, this next move doesn't make sense to me, but what they do is they go and they find his wife and the father, and they do what they promised to do in the beginning. They burn, they burn them all down in the house. And I think what happens here, maybe they're trying to cut ties with Samson so he's not, like, we don't want this guy anymore. They're trying to cut ties with Samson so that he's out of the picture and not connected to the Philistines anymore. So after he does this, we find he really has a heart for this woman. Now he's like Liam Neeson taken angry at this point. <laughs> we thought he was angry before. It's a whole new level. Verse 7, after the Philistines come up, they burn the, her and the father with fire. Verse 7, Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you. And after that, I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow. And he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock at Etam. So he strikes them hip and thigh. I think it's an old-timey way of saying that he went, found the people responsible for this, probably some innocent bystanders too, and just massacred all of them. So at this point, his supernatural strength has got to start to be on display by the Philistines. They're starting to get scared. In fact, in the next chapter, we don't, we don't get there, but they call him the ravager of our land, the ravager of our land who has multiplied our slain. He's like terrorizing the Philistines. They feel terrorized by this guy. And they should have listened to him. They should have left him alone because he said he was going to quit. But they just can't get enough punishment. They go after him again. But this time, they get someone else to do their dirty work for them. Verse 9. So the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. This is a, an Israelite town. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? The Philistines said, we have come up to bind Samson, to do to him as he did to us. So what happens here, the Philistines start to attack this town of Israel called Lehi. And the people of the town, the men of Judah, they don't understand why are the Philistines attacking us all of a sudden. 
we've been good little hostages this whole time. Why are they coming after us all of a sudden? And when they realize it's because of Samson, they seem to almost volunteer to go. They, they, the Philistines didn't ask them to go get Samson. It's like they volunteered to go find Samson themselves. So the people of Israel, they collect 3,000 soldiers, Israelite warriors, and they go and they find Samson. And here is where it is revealed how bad it's actually gotten in Israel. Um, they aren't just not asking for help. They don't want help, right? They want the Philistines to rule over them instead. They don't want any help from Samson or God. Because what we should read next in the text, we should read something like this. And when the warriors found Samson, he led them in battle and defeated the Philistines and the land had rest for 40 years or something like that. That's what we should read next. But here's what actually happened, starting in verse 11. And notice the strange, it's really strange. Verse 11, Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock at Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this then that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, We've come down to bind you, that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. They said to him, No, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will not surely kill you. So what's going on here? Instead of a war cry against the Philistines, this is what we get. The men of Judah are basically saying to Samson, they're saying, listen, Samson, we got a good thing going on with the Philistines. Don't you know they are our rulers? And they may crush us from time to time, they may oppress us, but that's the way things are. And you are messing this whole thing up. We don't want to be saved. So they see Yahweh's enemies, the Philistines, as their rightful lords. That's not true. The Lord is. But they see the Lord and they see his Savior as their enemy, getting in the way of them serving the Philistines. How upside down has it gotten in Israel? And they're going to take, here's the, here's the kicker. They're going to take the one guy, the one person in all the land that could save them or even cares about them in the slightest, and they are going to deliver him to be killed, the one person that could save them. So they bind Samson with two new ropes, and they bring him up from the rock to the Philistines. And when he came to Lehi, the back to where the Philistines are, verse uh, 14, and when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him, then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and put out his hand and took it, and with it he struck a thousand men. So after the people of Judah hand Samson over to be killed, God melts the ropes off of his arms, and he picks up the jawbone of a donkey. I have a picture of a jawbone of a donkey. You can see it's got a great handle. You just want to grab it and hit somebody with it, don't you? <laughs> uh, that one doesn't look very fresh. We have the fresh one. I wonder how fresh it was. Is it like a donkey walking around without a jaw somewhere? <laughs> you just grab one. Um, but he grabs one of those, and he starts w killing people with it. And because it's fresh, and it's probably a little miracle mixed in too, it, it lasts all the thousand people that he had to kill. He kills a thousand warriors with it. You get the feeling that if, if if he wanted to, if it was necessary, he could kill 10,000. And our text ends, verse 16, with a beautiful poem by Samson about heaps and heaps of the Philistines' dead bodies. <laughs> I think I have a slide that has that, maybe. Yeah, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. Beautiful. So God fights for these Israelites. He saves them when they don't want to be saved. But here's one more big question, and it has to do with these people's hearts. Oh, here's, a, here's the question number two. How does God respond when his people don't want to be saved? What happens here? He saves them anyway. He accomplishes salvation for his people anyway. It does not depend on your desire or your effort, his people's desire or his people's effort. He comes and he saves you anyway. God fights for them even when they don't want to be saved. Our last question, though, is going to lead into the next question. How does God respond to hearts that don't trust him? He's laid out this salvation. It's right in front of them. All they have to do is grab it. 
God has done everything necessary for their salvation. Look at this scene. There's heaps upon heaps of their enemies that Samson has killed in battle. Where are the Israelites, though? <laughs> you ever wonder where they went? R verse 18, Samson goes, let's go to the jawbone, and he's thirsty. I think I have verse 18, maybe. And he was very thirsty, and he called up, no, he's very thirsty, he calls upon the Lord and said, you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant, and shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the circumcised, uncircumcised? Um, where did the, all of these Israelite warriors go? Surely there's somebody's got a flask or a, a bladder of water that he can take a sip from. They're all gone. They left him. They left him all alone. They left him. They chose, instead of following Samson in this fight that was unlosable, they ran away. God did everything needed to secure their salvation against the Philistines, and they ran from it. They ran from it. These people in our text, they don't, it's really bad. These people in our text, they don't want to follow Samson, and they don't want to follow and trust this God who accomplishes salvation for them. God takes care of everything. Notice the battle's won. All they have to do is take it. The table's set for a feast. The table is all set. The ball is all teed up. All they have to do is take it, to live in it but the people still refuse to trust him. The one thing that they lack is trust. They're incapable of trusting God by themselves. Samson, you know, he can save Israel. He can, do, he can do a lot for Israel, but Samson is incapable of changing these people's hearts. He is incapable of implanting faith and trust into their souls. God can tee it all up for us but unless we have faith, unless we have trust, that's what faith means, unless we trust him, we'll never grab on to this great salvation. We will neglect this great salvation, as the writer of Hebrews said earlier. But Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, can. He gives us that trust. That's the trust. It's absent in this text. Maybe a little bit in Samson. He cries out to God for water. It's absent in this text. But what these people need is trust. What they need is faith in Jesus, which is what he gives us. I have a, I'm going to look elsewhere from this text that's not here. I'm going to look at Ephesians 2, verse 8. This is one of my favorite texts. And it says, I think I have it up there. We are saved by faith through grace. And this faith is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Faith to trust him, that is even a gift from God that he gives to us. You know how God, this is how God responds to people that don't trust him. His people that don't trust him, he gives us faith. Here is what this text leaves us asking ourselves. So just like with the Israelites, it doesn't matter who you are, God has done everything necessary to make you right with him, to, get, to make a right relationship with God. All those people's ugly sins in this book, all their transgressions, all their rebellion, he still wants these people. It's crazy. He still wants these people. I might have mentioned this before. People talk about God of the Old Testament being some kind of fire and brimstone God. It's not true, man. He's, his heart is bleeding for these people that are so un, un, uh, untrusting of him, that are so adulterous toward him. His heart bleeds for them. He'll do anything to bring them to him. And if his heart beats like this for these kind of people, what do you think you can do to turn him away from you. Here's, like, here's a hypothetical question, okay? Unlike Israel, what if we trusted in, personally trusted in this God? What if God, what if you trusted that God loved you and everything was going to be okay? This is what the Israelites should have, God by what happened with, with Samson, God loves us. Everything's going to be okay. We can trust him now. What if this was true for you? What if everything was going to be okay and God loved you. What would change? What would you change about your life if you actually believe this or believe this deeper? Or what could you let go if you believed that God loved you and everything was going to be okay? And you can't mess it up. That thing you're worried about later today, uh, that thing you're worried about later this week, that thing you're worried that you will never get, that thing you're deeply worried will eventually happen. What if God loved you, and everything was going to be okay. 
Maybe the bad thing would happen. But what if God loved you and everything was going to be okay? What about the things you're worried that you're going to fail and it's going to ruin your life? What about the worry we feel for how other people think about us? What if the Lord was taking care of you through this all? What if you didn't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore, ultimately? What would change? What if God, what if, hypothetically, what if, and this is all true if you trusted Jesus, what if God was going to take care of you and cherish you no matter what you did? What if the Lord was fighting your enemies and saves you from your enemies? What if he saved you from all the guilt and all the punishment you deserve for all the bad things you've done, the bad things you've never told anybody about? What if Jesus took that punishment for you on the cross and your relationship with God was secure forever? And what if it is assured that the whole world, at the end of history, is going to be this place that Jesus secures for us where there's no sin, there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no sadness, there's no tears, and we're going to live there with him forever. What if everything was going to turn out okay? Ensuring this is not Samson. He is not in Samson's wheelhouse to make all these things come true. <laughs> Samson's only a man. But this text, this story, has so many places in it that points forward to the actual one that's going to do this for us. Because a thousand years after Samson, there was a, another miraculous birth that was announced by heavenly being. A thousand years after this, there was a, a man that was born to save Israel too. Remember, Samson was born to save Israel from the Philistines. This man was born to save us from our sins. This man was also handed over, bound, bound by his own people to Gentile overlords, the Romans, to be put to death because he got in the way. And after he accomplished everything his people needed on the cross, he cried out that he was thirsty too, like Samson. But he was more than a judge. He was the judge that all these judges are pointing to. He's not just the king. He is the king of kings. And he did everything necessary for your salvation and the renewal of the whole world as well. If the people were to trust in Samson, they would share in his victory over the Philistines. But as we trust in Jesus, we share in his victory over sin, over death, over Satan, over sickness, over injustice, over it all. Samson's victory was assurance that when it came to their enemies, everything was going to be okay. God's got this. This week, here's, here's our homework. Ask yourself this question this week. At least once. Ask it. If not, many times. Ask yourself this question. What if in Jesus, in what he has done, everything is going to be okay? What would that look like to trust him? Maybe even trust him for the first time. Just ask that question. What if because Jesus is the king and he loves me, everything will be okay? What would it look like for us to trust him? Let's pray. Father, we pray you would take this story of Samson and the king that Samson points to and you would help us to trust you so that we can love you and love our neighbor and love our enemies and love annoying people. <laughs> love the people in our families. And we pray that you would set us free to serve you this week. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. service unto the Lord is in the giving of our tithes and offerings, and this is a time here in the service where we dedicate those tithes and offerings, however it is that we are actually doing it, uh, whether that's online or with a QR code on the, uh, with the, uh, the insert or, or there in the back, those boxes, however it is that we are, in fact, responding in that way, this is a time of dedicating that, of entrusting that prayerfully, meditatively. Um, intentionally dedicating that to him. And it's appropriate at these moments to uh, pause and hear him, hear the Lord speak to us on the matters of, Will was just speaking of, the, 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 the different things that we can trust in, in this case, money. God has blessed us. He's provided for us. But gracious sakes, how we tend towards trusting in the provision instead of the provider. And that will betray us. That, that's a crutch that will give way. It's just a matter of time. 
Paul writes of this in first, uh, excuse me, First Timothy, First Timothy chapter six, verse seventeen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Can we pray together? Jesus, however it is that we are responding in the giving, um, entrusting to you of our earthly treasure and leaning into you more in terms of your provision. Jesus, we, we want to take hold of that which is truly life. And that's you. And Lord, would you help us even in this concrete act to um, may that be an expression of the whole of our lives of a taking hold of taking hold of, of you and, and not taking hold not taking hold of anything else uh, that our grip would be loosened on you Jesus we thank you for the assurance even even if our group our grip does turn loose of your of you yours on us never will and so we then give all the more gladly knowing that even as we slip in this, uh, you, your grip never slips from us. We praise you for giving this, the, all these things and more in mind. We pray in your name. Amen. stand and join us. sending you out into the world with this blessing from Romans chapter 15. Receive this word from our Lord and Savior. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.